Buongiorno and welcome to Seen Any Good Films Lately, coming to you from Venice. I'm Jason Solomons and I'm on the Lido for Venice 78, where the Oscar contenders have their world premieres alongside the grand auteurs of world cinema. I'll have the latest reviews from the early days of Venice and I've got a guest director from back home who's having a bit of a renaissance himself. Well, that opening scene was yeah. like, literally, you, as a director, you're thinking, how have you done this? That's the director, Paul Wayland, one of the most successful and prolific advertising directors of all time, whose personal film, 66, starring Eddie Marsden and Helena Bonham Carter, has now popped up on Netflix and earned a whole new audience. We'll hear a special recording of Seen Any Good Films Lately with him after I tell you what I've seen at the Venice Film Festival. Estás casada? No, ¿y tú? Yo, no, no. Pues las dos somos madres solteras. Lo mío fue un accidente, pero estoy tan contenta. Lo mío también fue un accidente. Yo no me arrepiento, ¿eh? Yo sí. Pobre, no digas eso. And that's Penelope Cruz in the new Pedro Almodovar film Parallel Mothers, which opened Venice the other night. I loved it. The story of two very different single mothers who give birth at the same time in a Madrid hospital and whose lives entwine thereafter. After his excellent pain and glory with Antonio Banderas and his rather stilted project with Tilda Swinton, the human voice, Almodovar now strides into new territory with his latest, examining the poisonous legacy of the Spanish Civil War and the impact of family and memory, of opening up old wounds and excavating old graves. It's a very moving film, I cried, but also quite farcical and funny and teetering on the verge of melodrama in that classic Almodovarian way. Cruz is fabulous, never better in fact, her most mature and complex performance, And there are some wonderful touches and elegant time skips in the telling. I didn't think Almodovar would ever get back to the scintillating form of 20 years ago when he delivered all about my mother, bad education and talked to her. But even while examining familiar themes of mothers and actresses and the pueblo, he's finding something new and important to say and saying it beautifully. Another grand European director with new work here at Venice is Italy's Paolo Sorrentino with his Neapolitan memoir, the hand of God. At a certain point, he calls a journalist. Fellini says, the cinema doesn't serve anything, but you're distracted. For me, the journalist would have said something like, you're distracted, what kind of thing? And Fellini says, from the reality. The reality is falling. Just this he said. It seems very little. And he? The director of The Great Beauty, Il Devo and Youth, takes an indulgent yet luxurious trip down memory lane with a coming-of-age memoir of a teenager during the period when Maradona signed for Napoli. So we're talking about the mid-80s here, providing guidance and inspiration for the young man amid the tumult of his bonkers city and his own madcap family who assemble and squabble over Sunday dinners. What a cast of characters he's created here. Characters, maybe. Caricatures, perhaps. The old woman in fur guzzling a whole buffalo mozzarella. The wannabe actor, who's his brother, the sexy aunt and the bullying uncle. There's a shady businessman and lawyer and a giant spinster aunt with an ageing new fiancé who can only speak through a voice box. I have to say I enjoyed it very much. Every shot, every incident. Not a whole lot happens as such dramatically, and yet lives are being lived and shouted about, and it looks fabulous. It's not perfect, but it does acknowledge its unreliable, almost fairy tale state as a sentimental journey back to an unbelievable time. There was also a new film from Jane Campion to Gorpat, Power of the Dog, a cowboy movie starring Benedict Cumberbatch and Jesse Plemons as wealthy Montana ranching brothers, and there's Kirsten Dunst and Cody Smith-McKee as the woman and her son who come between them. 
This was fabulous to look at, shot in New Zealand, but sort of set in Montana, the wide open spaces. And it has a superb Johnny Greenwood score, which sews it all together and sets it all very much on edge. Power of the Dog is one of those that seeps into you. It's set in a strange world that looks familiar, but turns it on its head as Campion examines masculinity and jealousy and power and possession. Very toxic, this film. Cumberbatch is particularly good, relishing the language of an excellent script and convincing you as a smart, dangerous cowboy whose life is on the ropes. <laughs> It's just a man. Only another man. So that's three pretty strong films right at the start for me. But let's hear what some of my critical colleagues on the Lido have seen and made of these early films as we hear from festival regulars John Bleasdale from the Writers on Film podcast, Wendy Eide of Screen International and first, German journalist Patrick Heidman. I liked the Jane Campion film. Yeah. Um, it was a... Do you say it was a grower? Is that something that you say? Because I didn't love it immediately but now I do, like a day later. Yeah. So, exactly. It's yeah. quite. I think it's quite strong. And did you see the Paolo Sorrentino film? Yes, but it got on my nerves so badly that I left after an hour. Really? I don't like his cinema at all. Too indulgent, too florid. Too indulgent, too much. I want to be Fellini, but I'm not. <laughs> yeah. And also too sexist. No matter what he tells me, it's always sexist. Yeah. So, Patrick, I love. I love that take on it. Wendy Eide is here in Venice. It's been a long time since you've been in Venice. Very long time. Happy to be back though. It really is just a delight to be here. Have you seen anything good lately here? I'm going to join in with the chorus of approval for the Almodovar film, uh, Parallel Mothers, although I really don't like the title. It sounds like kind of parallel parking or something and you know, it just doesn't roll off the tongue. I'm going to pick up on one thing which I'm not sure um, people will notice if they're not mothers. Now, you know, motherhood in cinema is something that's explored a lot, um, but m the relationships of mothers that are explored are almost entirely, you know, with their children. Now, this is really great on that very intense uh, bond that forms between mothers who are pregnant at the same time. And I haven't seen that explored very often. Um, so this, this is something that I really connected with. John. Uh, what about the Maradona thing? You're a football fan as much as that. And in fact, a Liverpool fan. And it, uh, Asif Kapadi often said when he was doing that Mar Maradona film, he realised that Naples and, and Liverpool are quite similar. Like, no one likes us, we don't care, and everyone thinks we're chirpy, but in fact we're like, like a bunch of thieves. And there's a sort of line in, in the Sorrentino about that. How, how was that football thing, football madness conveyed to you? Yeah, I thought it was good at the very beginning. And, and the idea of the brothers celebrating when Maradona gets signed for Napoli and this idea that, I mean, because Napoli was, as the Kapadi do documentary shows, was this real nothing club until he turned up and he came from Barcelona uh, so I, I thought that was well done but it kind of disappears from the movie quite early on in fact there's a scene where the main character sort of turns off the television when there's a match on and you and you know things have gone south when that happens yeah John these they always good to see you in Venice mate you're you're a guide to the Italian barometer you are <laughs> good to see you Jason thanks thanks Patrick John and Wendy I'll have more from Venice next week But away from the Lido is 66, a delightful British film about a bar mitzvah boy whose big occasion falls on the day of the England versus Germany 1966 World Cup final at Wembley. The film first hit the screens in 2006 to a modest but proud success, but it's now reappeared on Netflix and become a cult hit. Some boys don't get picked in life. Temple. He's German, he's Welsh, he's got polio. Oh God, Rubens! And that's me. Ow! Bernie Rubens dreamt of being remembered. Where's Bernie? So when the biggest day of his life finally arrived. A bar mitzvah is the most important time in a person's life. Everybody you know will be invited, everyone will come, there will be presents everywhere. 
he could never have expected. When is it? 30th of July. To have a little competition. It's the World Cup final. The World Cup final. Bollocks, Its director is Paul Wayland, whose career has seen him work with Gary Lineker on The Walker's Crisp Lads, and with Rowan Atkinson on Bean and Blackadder, and with Billy Crystal on City Slickers too. I was asked to host a live recording of this Seen Any Good Films Lately podcast for the charity Jewish Care with Paul, and in this edited version of it, I begin by asking him how he came to make the story of his mitzvah into a hit comedy movie. The story of the movie is basically I reached 50 and I was in quite heavy therapy at the time. And I basically was talking to my therapist. I said, look, I've been to some really very posh 50th birthday parties. And the people that were 50 gave some really, really remarkable speeches. And I've got this party coming up and I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what I could say. And she just said, well, can I give you a bit of advice? Just be who you are. And I went away and I thought, okay, party, blah. When was the last big party I had? Oh yeah, my permission. That was a disaster. And then that's how the idea came. So I wrote a speech about it and literally it went down so well at my party. And I was, you know, I was quite connected at that point. So all the great and good work at my party in my house in the country. And as I finished the speech, everyone got to their feet and it was seriously, yeah, laughter, tears, whatever. And the guys from Working Title came up to me and said, we're gonna make that as a movie. And the next week, Richard Curtis and I sat down and we wrote a treatment and that's how it came about. What, were you worried about putting British Jewish life on screen? I think back then, we're talking sort of 15 years ago, <laughs> There was a yeah. confidence and sort of saying, look, you know, we're, we're, we're important, we're Jewish, we're part of this community, we're part of this culture. And yet, it, whilst, whilst, you know, you're making, you know, big success of, uh, of making films and, you know, you've got Jewish uh, culture everywhere, it's not that often that we get to stick it on screen. You know what I mean? The actual seeing of, of how yeah. it might work. Where, yeah. where were you uh, at that well, time? I mean, culturally? the Greeks yeah. aren't embarrassed about showing their Greekness and the Indians not showing about their Indianness. But the thing about... Jewish movies, it's quite rare for them to be, I think they're very, very popular with um, Hampstead Garden Suburb and, you know, basically Finchley. But I think that, I don't know what it is about Jewish movies, quite hard for them to be accepted. I, you know, and it's pretty sad. And what I was really conscious of, I, there was no way that I wanted to be stereotyping Jews. I, I was really conscious of that. And I wanted this really to be about working class people who happen to be Jewish. And that's why when I cast it, I didn't necessarily, you know, there were Jewish actors in it, but I wanted, I didn't want the oy vey everything. Mm. We put a lot of Yiddish in it and, you know, Oya Broch and whatever, but I was very conscious that I wanted this to be grounded. And I, want, and I think that's why I think it warmed for people because otherwise you do get a lot of slightly, there was a, at that time a few other Jewish films that literally made my skin crawl, if I'm honest. Yeah, I there's felt. a Susie Gold yeah. and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, which it, people don't, people in those movies don't talk People in, in real life don't talk like they talk in those movies. They become, just because they get on screen, they become ultra Jewish. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. Become... And that's what happened with Helena. Like, so basically, you know, this is your biggest dread. And we sat down for the first rehearsal a week before the shoot. And Helena did a bit of a Jewish accent. And I like, oh, no, what am I going to say? I can't let you do this. And then I immediately got her in a cab and she spent a day with my mother. And that solved it. So she's doing mom your mum? Yeah, she, my mum was Bo. She, you know, she, yeah, she just was, a, she had a bit of a Cockney accent and that's the way we played it. So, but I was very aware that I didn't want it to be, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, we, we really don't. Uh, and you cast Eddie Marsden as, as your dad. Yeah. Uh, who, he's an East End boy. He's not Jewish as an actor, although he, he seems to get cast as Jews more than anyone else. Yeah, that I he know. does look like a potato, doesn't he? A he potato does. bucket, yeah. He's, he's a wonderful performance in the in the film, I think. Yeah, he's good. Again, he had the, um, probably he's got the best role in the movie, but again, my dad, I could have made a very different movie. If it wasn't working title, um, I could have made quite a serious movie about the true relationship between my father, a boy and his father, 
because you know my dad wasn't really well and the OCD thing in the movie is just touched upon but for humorous reasons but it was quite serious growing up in that environment and Eddie it was like as I said almost like the best professional experience of my life I love working with all the actors and Eddie and it's almost like just even down to remember you know the way my dad used to peel an apple you know in one piece like forever it took him forever and you know just getting Eddie to do that because everything just feels so real and it comes from yeah it comes from a place that you've lived yeah I think well, I think it, it, it's a really smashing little film and I was amazed when people started talking about it again a few months ago people start saying well have you seen 66 Jason have you seen it? I said well of course I've seen it It was like you know 10-15 years ago I said well was, you know it's just come on Netflix was that a surprise to you to, to sort of yeah, see yeah, it reboot it again um, I got a call from someone saying I've just seen 66 pop up on Netflix and then I started getting re recommended for Paul Netflix 66 and I'm going really and then I started to watch a bit of it. And then it keeps reminding me that I haven't finished it. Keeps coming back. Do you want to finish it? Do you want, I should really finish it because they probably think I didn't like it. But again, <laughs> um, another friend of mine who works on The Crown, I said, go on, find out. Because again, on one hand, you're highly delighted that it's found a new audience. But on the other hand, you're thinking, that's the audience it should have found originally. <laughs> So it's quite, and so career-wise, it's almost like, oh, you know, because you do need, you know, what the movie business is like. They they do look at box office numbers and then, yeah, it's, I'm glad that it's, it seems to be popular and I've had quite a lot of feedback and yeah. When you were making it and you were using the clips of the goals, the famous Bobby Charlton goals, and uh, did you have to liaise with the FA and did you have to talk to the old 66 players that were, I mean, a few uh, of them I have, have gone since then? Permission. No, I don't think we needed their permission. Basically, the only colour footage that existed was from, um, I think it was from Pathé or ITV. BBC was only black and white. And in a way, I might not have been able to make the movie had we not been able to have the colour footage because the whole idea that I went to Wembley and I was in that crowd. And, you know, even then, like when I showed it this week and they were watching and they saw me patting the players on the back, they're going, how'd you do that? How'd you do that? But we could, that footage is just priceless. It was, and yeah, it was a great, it, those are, you know, sometimes you get a bit of luck. And um, the two bits of luck was that my brother's permits for footage still existed. So I could do the titles on that. And even then people were going, is that really you? Was that, yeah. So that, those are, yeah, just fantastic stuff. And he had quite a big bar mitzvah. But yeah, there is not one single photograph of me at my bar mitzvah. Which is because of, but what, because they didn't, no one had a camera or they were all distracted? No, I don't know what happened. I think, you know, as the rabbi says, you know, you know how much your parents worry, the hair loss, the, the whole thing. I think, you know, my parents were quite very anxious people as well. And I think my brother's bar mitzvah, although you wouldn't know it judging by the footage because they look so glamorous, they look like film stars. And so that meant that I was not in the spotlight either, but not to have one single photograph is quite sad. It's quite and unusual. That's the, that's the truth. There are that too many true. of me. I've got to tell you, they're all over my, gra my grandma's house and then my pet and then there's the one with the, with the tollers on and one with my little brother and then there's one of all of us. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm yeah, like, this is much. 35 years ago, mum, we can change a picture. I've done other yeah. stuff. We, it's interesting, my son uh, is, is about to have a mitzvah a year, a year hence uh, and trying to persuade him to have one, your film is the perfect, he, he hasn't got that many Jewish friends so we don't go to that many bar mitzvahs. So to, to show him your film was to show him how, how his two, you know, these two worlds can collide. It actually yeah. inspired him to say, yes, I'm gonna have a bar mitzvah. I did it, that's very nice, yeah. I, so actually that goes, yeah, that's what, that really is touching. I mean, yeah, so the film is affecting, which I think is important and it does matter, you know, because it is the first time you're going to stand up there and the kids today are probably slightly different and then parties have got bigger and bigger for certain people. Uh, Paul, I'm going to ask you some some quick fire questions because I love okay. all this story about your film career and what you film. Like, and I'm sure all uh, all of our, our listeners and, and watchers there would like to know, you know, what, a, a bit about cinema and why we all love it and why you make a film like 66. So uh, have you seen any good films lately? What are you watching at the moment? Um, well, you know, I am lucky enough to be a member of BAFTA. So basically I get to see everything. 
And now at Christmas you get, and now it's all going online, but literally hundreds and hundreds of films. And they really do merge into this, probably you get it as well, yes, this so. kind of blamange. And it's like, well, what did I watch this? And then you go back and when you start voting, you see the list. But you know, things like obviously everyone's watched Nomadland, I wasn't blown away by it, but then when I realized not one of those people was a proper actor, mm. then you really take your hat off to that person and that dedication and what she pulled off there. So yeah, definitely deserve best director, best movie. What else did I love? The Trial of the Chicago Seven, I yeah. thought like, absolutely brilliantly written, brilliantly acted. And the English film I liked was The Dig. Oh yeah, The Grey Finds and... Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, which I thought was very beautifully made, very gentle. And um, a friend of mine, John Preston, wrote the book. And yeah, I was not expecting... And actually, I really like that. But there were quite a few... At first, you think there's nothing here, but slowly... As they you come and they see. stay in your mind, don't they? They, they stay watch. in your mind, yeah. What does, a, what, does a, what does a filmmaker and, a, and, a, and an ad director watch when he wants to watch some just rubbish? Do you know what I mean? I mean the sort of rubbish that just passes over. Do you, are you a reality TV fan? Do you watch comedies? Um, I just watch the news. That's rubbish <laughs> enough for me. That's reality and comedy all, all yeah, rolling at once. Like, yeah, that's a tragedy, a train <laughs> crash. But yeah, I just... Um, these days I'm in the garden a lot. I don't waste my time on Love Island or whatever, but sometimes you do stumble upon not necessarily crappy TV, but I really loved Mayor of Easttown. Did you see that? Oh, with Kate Winslet. Yeah, that's yeah. A, a proper thriller, though, that was. I mean, uh, like, Yeah, and they're, easy. again, so surprising and something that you really... That, twists and turns and very well acted, very well written. And yeah, I thought that, and again, this, this, it felt real. It felt like this had actually happened in this very close knit community where everyone knows each other. So I love that. Um, you haven't well, done any of this high end TV series that they call them, you know, these Netflix series, you know. Um, I, I, well, I've been trying to get one made, but I can't know for some reason, I don't know why with a really good producer called Stephen Garrett, it was a movie that was written by, originally Peter Strawn was one of the writers on my movie, 66. So I commissioned him a lot in the early days and we had this thing called Three Bad Men that then became Three Strange Angels that we converted to TV. And it was his first really, because he's gone on to be a huge yeah, Oscar winner. Yeah. So this was his first like um, film that he wrote commissioned by me great script and it was his calling card and he got lots of work and for some reason we just can't get this thing made and I don't know why but it's one of those things yeah TV is so good the Queen's Gambit and Succession I like all the good stuff yeah yeah good choices what was the yeah. first film you saw at the cinema um well it's a bit of an embarrassing story because I think I obviously sort of went to see some cartoons but my parents didn't weren't big cinema goers I don't think but they took me to see Natalie Wood in Gypsy Rose Lee. <laughs> and I think it was in 1962. And I, it was quite embarrassing because I was about eight or nine and I leant across to my mum. I said, my willy's gone funny when she was doing the stripping sequence. And that's why uh, that's my first memory of, a, of, a, of cinema having an effect on me. Probably not the most um, best effect for this, for this audience today, but literally, yeah. Do you know where that was? Um, yeah, it was um, our cinema. So we had an Odeon in Southgate, but we used to go to a bit of a flea pit called que The Queens in Palmer's Green. Oh. And um, I used to go to Saturday morning pictures a lot there, running up and down the aisle. So yeah, very early on, you know, like the Lone Range and Tonto and all that stuff. Yeah, it's cinema and then musicals. Got taken to a lot of musicals like South Pacific and things like that. And they... I think they, I love musicals. I yeah. did. Most kids are falling asleep the minute the kissing moment comes on. But I love, I've always loved them. Was there a yeah. film that changed your life? You know, when you go, there's a certain time of your life when you're a teenager or a student or one of those, and you go and see something, someone tells you, you go and see it, and you suddenly go, oh, I, di I just didn't know movies could be like that. And, I, you know, it's well, changing the way I think. It, was it Poor Cow? Ken Loach's Poor Cow. Yeah, mm. I think the grit in that, where that's when I suddenly thought, oh, this is real. We were too young to go in, so we had bunked in the back door for that one because we never paid to go into the cinema in those days. <laughs> this is Terence well, Stamp, person, beautiful, yeah, Terence Stamp. One, per, one person paid and the rest of us came in the back door. And I remember being mesmerised by that movie. Yeah, yeah, beautiful film. Uh, 1967, I think it's 67, off the top of my head, yeah. might not be. I know all there is to know about the crying game. Let's have a 
have a look. Look on the little horse. Oh. Oh, me terrible. crying. Look at me crying. Yeah, look at your miserable face. <laughs> Why didn't you smile like me? That me not crying anymore. <laughs> no, that's you crying. Did you watch a film for 66? Did you watch them as sort of films that were inspirations for the time? Uh, not really. I've never been that much a director that does that. I, I'm i not a big researcher because I don't want to be accused of being like you plagiarise something mm. or whatever. Um, but again, you know, Saturday night, Sunday morning, those early black and white, just to really fill the period. Because what I found the most difficult was finding... First of all, the boy in 66, because all the Jewish boys were so well spoken now and they all go to, you know, posh private schools. So finding the boy was really difficult, especially someone that, and he was a bit handsome and he's gone on to much bigger things now. He's quite a success in Hollywood. But finding the location, so looking back on films to see where whether something would still exist was important. But I don't know. No, I didn't really have... Um, I don't think I looked at that much stuff. Did you leave even Jack Rosenthal's sort of famous, the, the famous Mitzvah Boy? Yeah, but Mitzvah Boy. And, uh, I remember seeing it years ago, but I don't, the quality would have been so bad. A bit mm. like that trailer that they ran before <laughs> we started talking. The quality was seriously yeah. bad. Never mind, never, mind the, never mind the quality, feel the grade. Did you have a film poster on your wall when you were a teenager or a student? Again, pretty obvious. I wrote that one down. That was um, Rackle Welsh in One Million Years BC. Wow. Yeah, you know, you I'm why a not? Boy. I'm a good, Jewish boy. If it's good enough for the Shawshank Redemption, it's certainly good enough for, for you. Do yeah. you have any now? Only 66. You got the poster, though? No, I did have the poster. I, I did um, I did a basically um, an Instagram on the day of the World Cup final. And I put the post, I've got the poster somewhere stuffed in a room upstairs and I took that out, but I don't really know. I don't put film posters up. No. What about if you, if, if I could give you the gift of time travel and you could go to any film set of any movie yet being made anywhere in the world, any director, any star, which one would you, would you drop um, into for a day or two? Well, I'd probably it would be a Hitchcock. One of the, you know, like maybe um, Psycho would be in, pretty exciting to go on. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Good choice. Um, but yeah, there would be quite a few. There would be quite a few if you could just go and be. But I always feel it's really funny because sometimes you go, you want to go to where it, you felt that the making of was so intense. And sometimes I think that comes through the screen um, when a movie is being, because a lot, making movies is a pretty painful experience, generally. it's. Um, but some of them are more, you know, you can imagine when you're in, um, like a Michael Mann movie or, you know, one of Tarantino's, like the, you can imagine the kind of stuff that he's putting people through and Oliver Stone and covering <laughs> people in real blood. And, you know, yeah, you just, I, it would be really nice because as a director, you don't really ever get to see other directors work, yeah. which is a bit, which is a shame. And um, yeah, because then you would interfere and you say, why have you put the camera there? Shouldn't it be over here? But sure, yeah. sure. Um, I thought you might be like, oh, I want to go to a Billy Wilder film or a Woody Allen movie and see. I thought those might be. Well, I would have gone to a Woody Allen movie, but now I can't suggest that. No. <laughs> yeah, which is very sad for him. But yeah, I, of all the directors that I would have ever liked to meet when I was in New York, I would always, you know, go to Elaine's hoping that I might bump into Woody Allen. But yeah, he was a bit of a hero. But then I, I do remember I loving his films, but always falling asleep. Later on, they did. Slightly get a bit slow, but anyway. But. Yeah, but if you get to Annie Hall, who wouldn't mind? Annie Hall, yeah. I did get. I did once get when um um I went to dinner once at Alan Parker's and um I got to take Diane Keaton home in my car. Literally, I, that was the biggest moment of my life. Wow. She just done Annie Hall, and I drove her back to her hotel on Park Lane. I just, I crunch the gears continuously because <laughs> you're always thinking, I wonder if she'll fancy me. I wonder if she, you know, and I had a Porsche at the time. I was quite, you know, I was a successful commercials director, but no, she just said, thanks for the lift. And <laughs> for the lift. You're a terrible driver. We'll walk yeah. to the curb yeah. from here. Um, have you ever fallen in love at the movies? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Hayley Mills. Mm. What, parent uh, trap? Um, well, Whistle Down the Wind was a favourite movie of mine and Parent Trap, the original Parent Trap. But that was, again, 
I, and interestingly, I met her, a friend of mine's father died and Hayley Mills was a friend of the family. Normally you do get to work, in commercial especially, you do get to work with your heroes at some point because they all do a commercial at some point. And if you're lucky enough, Hayley Mills, it, it never happened. And I remember going up to her and saying to her, do you know what? You are the person I think responsible for me becoming a movie director. And she said, but you've never used me. Why have you never used me? And I she went, wants oh, a gig. Well, she wants a yeah. gig. Yeah, she, wanted a, she wanted work. She yeah. wanted a work. How fain, how, Norman, how, Wisdom, Norman Wisdom was a big hero of mine growing up. And I did get to make a commercial for Heineken with Norman Wisdom. Did he fall over for you? Else. Pardon? Did he do the falling over? And the... He did. It was, a, it was a two minute commercial where he's trying to put a deck chair up in Scarborough on the pier there on the water on the front. And it was, I remember casting a waiter and the waiter had to go in with a pint of Heineken when he, and then he just kicks the chair and it magics up. And the waiter was absolutely useful. If you look it up, um, if, you, if you're technically minded, if you look up um, that commercial, I think, what was it? it was called Deck Chair, Normal Wisdom, Heineken. The waiter in it, I suddenly, I pushed the waiter out of the way because we were running out of light. I put the waiter's outfit on and you see me with, massive hair and it was very early on in my career and it was a Hitchcock moment. <laughs> I'm going to spot, I'm going to look that one up. And yeah, look it up, look it up too. What's your favourite uh, screen musical moment? It could be from a musical or a musical number, but it could be just, as, you know, when they use yeah. a song sometimes. Again, I was very jealous of the movie and I was, but I, I would say La La Land, the opening scene. Oh. For La La Land, I thought that was like beyond one shot, I mean. I loved that too, I have to say. Yeah. A lot of people tell me, oh, I love it and stupid, I didn't like it, but I, I, I thought it was delightful. Well, that opening scene was yeah. like, literally, you, as a director, you're thinking, this is, how have you done this? Yeah, Stop incredible. the traffic on the freeway. Yeah, yeah. Great choice. Even when the answer's no, my money is running low, just in my candy I'll go, for all I need. And someday as I sing the song, I hope it'll come along, that'll be the thing Where's your favourite cinema, Paul? Where is it? Yeah, or where was it? Maybe it's not there anymore. I would say... Memory-wise, um, it would have to be the Odeon at Southgate because, again, you know, where all the popcorn was and the ticket used to come out of the metal slot. Do you remember that? Yeah. It used to jump up. <laughs> yeah. But it was only, as I said, we were always going in the back door, so I didn't see that very often because, yeah, I never got to really... My friends were bullies and it was always me that had to go around the back <laughs> and you had to chip in to pay for someone. But yeah, that was just a classic movie. Now, I don't know, it's just a block of flats. But when cinemas are good, they're, and then obviously they all got very technical and, and it was great when you used to see the light and now everything's on beamed in, isn't it? It's mm. all changed. Mm. And... What's the best film location you've ever seen? on the big screen or it may be what the best place you've ever shot yourself having been to the quite exotic locations that you've yeah, shot but i think the um, most memorable and i've shot you know basically in my career i shot 1500 commercials personally so that's a lot so i went literally everywhere and i think the one that sticks with me is uh, was when coca-cola were launching in um in russia and we went to Moscow to shoot, and that was like beyond anything I've ever experienced. This was like in the then, old yeah. Soviet days. Um, yeah, no, well, they were opening up in those days. That was the day. And then basically what then happened, they spent an absolute, Coca-Cola spent an absolute fortune. I think the budget was something like oh, $3 million. And it was like four commercials and it was about the Firebird, the myth. And it was, uh, it, it was something that I wouldn't have normally done. It was very dramatic and very visual. But, you know, in the end, we were dealing with, it's another podcast, but we, I was dealing with dead bodies that were on set in churches where I'd gone to shoot a wedding sequence and someone was lying there dead. And they said, I said, well, I can't shoot in here. There's a, literally a dead body here. Oh, don't worry, we'll push it to the, 
into the back room. And it was like everything that could have gone wrong. I nearly lost the lead actress. People who were paid to narrate the whole story decide not to come to work the next day because they want to, everything is blackmail and they know we need them. And yeah, I can't tell you, it, but it was so cold. I literally, you know, the catering would turn up and the suit was frozen. You'd have to lick the top suit. <laughs> But it's one when it and my producers, I'd never seen the weight loss was unreal. They just basically no one ate anything. But for me, it was like the most exhilarating experience doing a commercial. But yeah, I've shot in like so many play, like in Moab for Silly Slickers, that was pretty amazing. And the canyons. Yeah, I've been lucky enough to see yeah, so much. I yeah, I feel very fortunate. <laughs> Where was it? Rosanna's Rosanna's grave? Was that was, was that a Tuscany place? Was that look? Was that Tuscany? Um, no, that was a place called Sermonetta near Rome. Well, near Rome, that looks beautiful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, beautiful. Again, shot that in just six weeks. The whole film these days that probably sounds like quite a long time, doesn't it? Yeah, but it, that's I a bit of charming, charming, beautiful location. There, yeah, right, and right. Jean Renault again was like the most gorgeous. I always found working with American actors the hardest. You know, European actors, English, that's so much easier. Feel part of the team where American actors just want to test you all the time, prod oh. you. <laughs> oh, no, don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was fun, talking to Paul Wayland. And the Q&A with the Jewish Care audience after was also a delight. So many people coming forward to share their own permits for memories and of having been extras in the film for Paul himself. I'll be doing another one for Jewish Care this month with the Bond team of Barbara Broccoli, Michael G. Wilson and composer Don Black. And of course, you'll get to hear that one too. Right, just time for a couple of other things I've seen uh, on TV, actually. I'm watching Pose season three, which has got all the great characters back, but seems to be rushing rather melodramatically through several crises every episode, from crack to alcohol abuse to the continuing AIDS epidemic and to the vast changes in the ballroom scene. It's all there, but it's just too overstuffed and polished and doesn't leave enough room for the developing wit and pathos that made the first two seasons so intriguing and so engrossing. But I am intrigued by The White Lotus. I've only seen one episode so far, but I'm definitely in for all of this one. It's a social satire set on a Hawaiian island resort. The titular hotel, of course, the White Lotus, has got various visitors and characters from a honeymooning couple to a wealthy family, a grieving daughter who's brilliantly played by Jennifer Coolidge, and the various hotel staff, including a very Basil Fawlty type manager. It's from the pen of Mike White, who did School of Rock and Nacho Libre for Jack Black and wrote and starred in Chuck and Buck. And it's got a superb score from Cristobal Tapia de Vere, who did Utopia and Humans. It's a real part of the, 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 the whole process, this score. is fabulous. And it's looking like The White Lotus is my current must-watch when I get back from all the offerings of Venice. So that's it. Thanks for listening, and thanks to Paul Whelan and to Jewish Care. 66 is on Netflix right now. The White Lotus is on Sky Atlantic and Now TV. And the Venice titles, I don't know when they're out. But uh, at the cinema in the UK, uh, try Our Ladies. Uh, you heard Michael Caton Jones, the director, on last week's podcast. And Wildfire, directed by Kathy Brady. That's on your screens now. See you very soon. Let's play out with a lovely tune that ends the Sorrentino film, Hand of God. It's an ode to Naples by Italian singer Pino Daniele. Napoli è. Eh. Ciao. Napoli non so la mare Napoli adori mare Napoli una carta sporca e nessuna sa ne importa e ognuna aspetta sciocca